20. For Morris Heisel, that Sunday was a day of miracles. The Atlanta Braves, his favorite baseball team, swept a doubleheader from the high and mighty Cincinnati Reds by scores of 7 to 1 and 8 to 0. Lydia, who boasted smugly of always taking care of herself and whose favorite saying was, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, slipped on her friend Janet's wet kitchen floor and sprained her hip. She was at home in bed. It wasn't serious, not at all, and thank God, what God, for that. But it meant she wouldn't be able to visit him for at least two days, maybe as long as four. Four days without Lydia. Four days that he wouldn't have to hear about how she had warned him that the stepladder was wobbly and how he was up too high on it in the bargain. Four days when he wouldn't have to listen to her tell him how she'd always said the Rogan's pup was going to cause them grief, always chasing Loverboy that way. Four days without Lydia asking him if he wasn't glad now that she had kept after him about sending in that insurance application. For if she had not, they would surely be on their way to the poorhouse now. Four days without having Lydia tell him that many people live perfectly normal lives, almost anyway paralyzed from the waist down. Why, every museum and gallery in the city had wheelchair ramps as well as stairs. And there were even special buses. After the observation, Lydia would smile bravely, and then inevitably burst into tears. Morris drifted off into a contented late afternoon nap. When he woke up, it was half past five in the afternoon. His roommate was asleep. He still hadn't placed Denker, but all the same, he felt sure that he had known the man at some time or other. He'd begun to ask Denker about himself once or twice, but then something kept him from making more than the most banal conversation with the man. The weather, the last earthquake, the next earthquake. And yeah, the guide says Myron Florin is going to come back for his special guest appearance this week on The Welk Show. Morris told himself he was holding back because it gave him a mental game to play. And when you were in a body cast from your shoulders to your hips, mental games can come in handy. If you had a little mental contest going on, you didn't have to spend quite so much time wondering how it was going to be pissing through a catheter for the rest of your life. If he came right out and asked Denker, the mental game would probably come to a swift and unsatisfying conclusion. They would narrow their pasts down to some common experience, a train trip, a boat ride, possibly even the camp. Denker might have been in Patton. There had been plenty of German Jews there. On the other hand, one of the nurses had told him Denker would probably be going home in a week or two. If Morris couldn't figure it out by then... He would mentally declare the game lost and ask the man straight out, say, I've had the feeling I know you. But there was more to it than just that, he admitted to himself. There was something in his feelings, a nasty sort of undertow, that made him think of that story, The Monkey's Paw, where every wish had been granted as the result of some evil turn of fate. The old couple who came into possession of the paw wished for a hundred dollars and received it as a gift of condolence when their only son was killed in a nasty mill accident. Then the mother had wished for the son to return to them. They had heard footsteps dragging up their walk shortly afterward, then pounding on the door. The mother, mad with joy, had gone rushing down the stairs to let in her only child. The father, mad with fear, scrabbled through the darkness for the dried paw, found it at last, and wished his son dead again. The mother threw the door open a moment later and found nothing on the stoop but an eddy of night wind. In some way, Morris felt that perhaps he did know where he and Denker had been acquainted, but that his knowledge was like the son of the old couple in the story, returned from the grave, but not as he was in his mother's memory, returned instead horribly crushed and mangled from his fall into the gnashing, whirling machinery. He felt that his knowledge of Denker might be a subconscious thing, pounding on the door between that area of his mind and that of rational understanding and recognition, demanding admittance, and that another part of him was searching frantically for the monkey's paw, or its psychological equivalent, for the talisman that would wish away the knowledge forever. Now he looked at Denker, frowning. Denker, Denker, where have I known you, Denker? Was it Patton? Is that why I don't want to know? 
But surely two survivors of a common horror do not have to be afraid of each other. Unless, of course... He frowned. He felt very close to it suddenly. But his feet were tingling, breaking his concentration, annoying him. They were tingling in just the way a limb tingles when you've slept on it and it's returning to normal circulation. If it wasn't for the damned body cast, he could sit up and rub his feet until that tingle went away. He could... Morris's eyes widened. For a long time, he lay perfectly still, Lydia forgotten, Denker forgotten, Patton forgotten, everything forgotten, except that tingly feeling in his feet. Yes, both feet, but it was stronger in the right one. When you felt that tingle, you said, my foot went to sleep. But what you really meant, of course, my foot is waking up. Morris fumbled for a call button. He pressed it again and again until the nurse came. The nurse tried to dismiss it. She had had hopeful patients before. His doctor wasn't in the building and the nurse didn't want to call him at home. Dr. Kebelman had a vast reputation for evil temper, especially when he was called at home. Morris wouldn't let her dismiss it. He was a mild man, but now he was prepared to make more than a fuss. He was prepared to make an uproar, if that's what it took. The Braves had taken two. Lydia had sprained her hip, but good things came in threes. Everyone knew that. At last, the nurse came back with an intern, a young man named Dr. Timpnell, whose hair looked as if it had been cut by a lawn boy with very dull blades. Dr. Timpnell pulled a Swiss Army knife from the pocket of his white pants, folded out the Phillips screwdriver attachment, and ran it from the toes of Morris's right foot down to the heel. The foot did not curl, but his toes twitched. It was an obvious twitch too definite to miss. Morris burst into tears. Timpnell, looking rather dazed, sat beside him on the bed and patted his hand. This sort of thing happens from time to time, he said, possibly from his wealth of practical experience, which stretched back perhaps as far as six months. No doctor predicts it, but it does happen, and apparently it's happened to you. Morris nodded through his tears. Obviously, you're not totally paralyzed, Timpnell was still patting his hand. But I wouldn't try to predict if your recovery will be slight, partial, or total. I doubt if Dr. Kemmerman will either. I suspect you'll have to undergo a lot of physical therapy, and not all of it will be pleasant. But it will be more pleasant than... you know. Yes, Morris said through his tears. I know. Thank God. He remembered telling Lydia there was no God and felt his face fill up with hot blood. I'll see that Dr. Kemmelman is informed, Timnell said, giving Morris's hand a final pat and rising. Could you call my wife? Morris asked. Because doom crying and hand wringing aside, he felt something for her. Maybe it was even love, an emotion which seemed to have little to do with sometimes feeling like you could wring a person's neck. Yes, I'll see that it's done. Nurse, would you? Of course, doctor, the nurse said, and Timnell could barely stifle his grin. Thank you, Morris said wiping his eyes with a Kleenex from the box on the nightstand. Thank you very much. Timpnell went out. At some point during the discussion, Mr. Denker had awakened. Morris considered apologizing for all the noise, or perhaps for his tears, and then decided no apology was necessary. Congratulated, I take it, Mr. Denker said. We'll see, Morris said, but like Timpnell, he was barely able to stifle his grin. We'll see. Things have a way of working out. Denker replied vaguely, and then turned on the TV with a remote control device. It was now quarter to six, and they watched the last of Hee Haw. It was followed by the evening news. Unemployment was worse. Inflation was not so bad. Billy Carter was thinking about going into the beer business. A new Gallup poll showed that if the election were to be held right then, there were four Republican candidates who could beat Billy's brother, Jimmy. And there had been racial incidents following the murder of a black child in Miami. A night of violence, the newscaster called it. Closer to home, an unidentified man had been found in an orchard near Highway 46, stabbed and bludgeoned. Lydia called just before 6.30. Dr. Kemmelman had called her, and based on the young intern's report, he had been cautiously optimistic. Lydia was cautiously joyous. She vowed to come in the following day, even if it killed her. Morris told her he loved her. Tonight he loved everyone. Lydia, Dr. Timpnell with his lawn boy haircut, Mr. Denker, even the young girl who brought in the supper trays as Morris hung up. 
Supper was hamburgers, mashed potatoes, a carrots and peas combination, and small dishes of ice cream for dessert. The candy striper who served it was Felice, a shy, blonde girl of perhaps 20. She had her own good news. Her boyfriend had landed a job as a computer programmer with IBM and had formally asked her to marry him. Mr. Denker, who exuded a certain courtly charm that all the young ladies responded to, expressed great pleasure. Really, how wonderful. You must sit down and tell us all about it. Tell us everything. Omit nothing. Felice blushed and smiled and said she couldn't do that. We've still got the rest of the B-Wing to do and C-Wing after that. And look, here it is, 6.30. Then tomorrow night for sure. We insist, don't we, Mr. Heisel? Yes, indeed, Morris murmured. But his mind was a million miles away. You must sit down and tell us all about it. Words spoken in that exact same bantering tone. He had heard them before. Of that there could be no doubt. But had Denker been the one to speak them? Had he? Tell us everything. The voice of an urbane man. A cultured man. But there was a threat in the voice. A steel hand in a velvet glove, yes. Where? Tell us everything. Omit nothing. Patin? Morris Heisel looked at his supper. Mr. Denker had already fallen to with a will. The encounter with Felice had left him in the best of spirits. The way he had been after the young boy with the blonde hair came to visit him. A nice girl, Denker said, his words muffled by a mouthful of carrots and peas. Oh, yes, you must sit down. Felice, you mean, she's... And tell us all about it. Very sweet. Tell us everything. Omit nothing. He looked down at his own supper, suddenly remembering how it got to be in the camps after a while. At first you would have killed for a scrap of meat, no matter how maggoty or green with decay. But after a while that crazy hunger went away and your belly lay inside your middle like a small gray rock. You felt you would never be hungry again until someone showed you food. Tell us everything, my friend. Omit nothing. You must sit down and tell us all about it. The main course on Morris's plastic hospital tray was hamburger. Why should it suddenly make him think of lamb? Not mutton, not chops. Mutton was often stringy, chops often tough. And a person whose teeth had rotted out like old stumps would perhaps not be overly tempted by mutton or a chop. No, what he thought of now was a savory lamb stew, gravy-rich and full of vegetables, soft, tasty vegetables. Why think of lamb stew? Why, unless the door banged open? It was Lydia, her face rosy with smiles. An aluminum crutch was propped in her armpit, and she was walking like Marshall Dillon's friend Chester. Morris, she trilled. Trailing her and looking just as tremulously happy was Emma Rogan from next door. Mr. Denker, startled, dropped his fork. He cursed softly under his breath and picked it up off the floor with a wince. It's so wonderful! Lydia was almost baying with excitement. I called Emma and asked her if we could come tonight instead of tomorrow. I had the crutch already and I said, Em, I said, if I can't bear this agony for Morris, what kind of wife am I to him? Those were my very words, weren't they, Emma? Emma Rogan, perhaps remembering that her collie pup had caused at least some of the problem, nodded eagerly. So I called the hospital, Lydia said, shrugging her coat off and settling in for a good long visit. And they said it was past visiting hours, but in my case they would make an exception. Except we couldn't stay too long because we might bother Mr. Denker. We aren't bothering you, are we, Mr. Denker? No, dear lady, Mr. Denker said resignedly. Sit down, Emma. Take Mr. Denker's chair. He's not using it. Here, Morris, stop with the ice cream. You're slobbering it all over yourself just like a baby. And never mind, we'll have you up and around in no time. I'll feed it to you. Goo, goo, ga, ga, open wide. Over the teeth, over the gums. Look out, stomach, here it comes. Now, don't say a word. Mommy knows best. Would you look at him, Emma? He has hardly any hair left, and I don't wonder, thinking he might never walk again. It's God's mercy. I told him that stepladder was wobbly. I said, Morris, I said, come down off there before... She fed him ice cream and chattered for the next hour. 
and by the time she left hobbling ostentatiously on the crutch while Emma held her other arm, thoughts of lamb stew and voices echoing up through the years were the last things in Morris Heisel's mind. He was exhausted. To say it had been a busy day was putting it mildly. Morris fell deeply asleep. He awoke some time between 3 and 4 a.m., with a scream locked behind his lips. Now he knew. He knew exactly where and exactly when he had been acquainted with the man in the other bed. Except his name had not been Denker then. Oh, no, not at all. He had awakened from the most terrible nightmare of his whole life. Someone had given him and Lydia a monkey's paw, and they had wished for money. Then somehow a Western Union boy in a Hitler youth uniform had been in the room with them. He handed Morris a telegram which read, Regret to inform you both daughters dead stop Patton concentration camp stop greatest regrets at this final solution stop Commandant's letter follows stop will you tell everything and omit nothing stop please accept our check for 100 Reichmarks on deposit your bank tomorrow stop signed Adolf Hitler Chancellor A great wail from Lydia and although she had never even seen Morris's daughter, she held the monkey's paw high and wished for them to be returned to life. The room went dark, and suddenly from outside came the sound of dragging, lurching footfalls. Morris was down on his hands and knees in a darkness that suddenly stank of smoke and gas and death. He was searching for the paw, one wish left. If he could find the paw, he could wish this dreadful dream away. He would spare himself the sight of his daughters, thin as scarecrows, their eyes deep wounded holes, their numbers burning on the scant flesh of their arms, hammering on the door. In the nightmare, his search for the paw became ever more frenzied, but it bore no fruit. It seemed to go on for years, and then, behind him, the door crashed open. No, he thought, I won't look. I'll close my eyes, rip them from my head if I have to, but I won't look. But he did look. He had to look. In the dream, it was as if huge hands had grasped his head and wrenched it around. It was not his daughter standing in the doorway. It was Denker, a much younger Denker, a Denker who wore a Nazi SS uniform, the cap with its death's head insignia cocked rakishly to one side. His buttons gleamed heartlessly. His boots were polished to a killing gloss. Clasped in his arms was a huge and slowly bubbling pot of lamb stew. And the dream Denker, smiling his dark, suave smile, said, you must sit down and tell us all about it, as one friend to another, huh? We have heard that gold has been hidden, that tobacco has been hoarded, that it was not food poisoning with Schneibel at all, but powdered glass in his supper two nights ago. You must not insult our intelligence by pretending you know nothing. You knew everything, so tell it all. Omit nothing. And in the dark, smelling the maddening aroma of the stew, he told them everything. His stomach, which had been a small gray rock, was now a ravening tiger. Words spilled helplessly from his lips. They spewed from him in the senseless sermon of a lunatic. Truth and falsehood all mixed together. Broden has his mother's wedding ring taped below his scrotum. You must sit down. Laszlo and Herman Dorksey have talked about Russian guard tower number three and tell us everything. Rachel Tannenbaum's husband has tobacco. He gave the guard who comes on after Zeke the one they call Booger Eater because he's always picking his nose and then putting his fingers in his mouth. Tannenbaum, some of it to Booger Eater so he wouldn't take his wife's pearl earrings. Oh, that makes no sense. No sense at all. You've mixed up two different stories, I think. But that's all right. Quite all right. We'd rather have you mix up two stories, then omit one completely, you must omit nothing. There is a man who has been calling out his dead son's name in order to get double rations. Tell us his name. I don't know it, but I can point him out to you, please. Yes, I can show him to you. I will, I will, I will, I will tell us everything you know. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I until he swam up into consciousness with a scream in his throat like fire. Trembling uncontrollably, he looked at the sleeping form in the other bed. He found himself staring particularly at the wrinkled, caved-in mouth, 
old tiger with no teeth, ancient and vicious rogue elephant with one tusk gone and the other rotted loose in its socket, senile monster. Oh, my God, Morris Heisel whispered. His voice was high and faint, inaudible to anyone but himself. Tears trickled down his cheeks towards his ears. Oh, dear God. The man who murdered my wife and my daughters is sleeping in the same room with me, my God. Oh, dear, dear God, he is here with me now in this room. The tears began to flow faster now, tears of rage and horror, hot, scalding. He trembled and waited for morning, and morning did not come for an age.